Hello music makers and audio wizards, today we're going to talk about EQs and distortion. As always, I'm not going to tell you do A, B or C, but I'm going to explain you the grounding principles so you can make an informed decision and doing things with purpose, because this is the purpose of this channel, helping you making decisions with purpose. Of course, I guess you all already know what an EQ does, what a distortion does, but do you really know how they work together and how actually to create something that is sounding maybe more analog with digital plugins, how to get warm yet crispy. And actually, did you already notice sometimes that actually while using a distortion to increase the brightness of a sound, the low end became muddy? Did you already notice that actually by turning on the distortion to increase the highs, you lost depth into the track and the low end was like fading away? Did you already think about boosting some frequencies before distortion and removing them after distortion or the opposite? We're going to talk about all this today to help you getting the most out of those tools and to get the best sounding distortion ever. Without any further ado, let's dive into the intricacy of what's happening here. And for this reason, we need to talk about intermodulation distortion. What is intermodulation distortion? There have already been quite some topics covering that online. To summarize, if you have one sinus wave and you add some distortion like this, you create harmonics. If you play a second sine wave like this and you add distortion, you create harmonics. But if you put distortion on those two sine waves playing together like this, you get this result. What's happening? Intermodulation distortion. So intermodulation distortion is a complex term that just explains that the distortion applies on the sum and the difference of those signals. So to make easy maths, you have 100 hertz and you have 150 hertz. 100 hertz, you have the first harmonic at 200, the third at 300 times two times three times four. 150 hertz, you have the first harmonic at 300, at 450 times two times three times four, etc. But also the difference between 100 and 150 is 50 hertz, so you get distortion at 50 hertz. So you get actually distortion and you have harmonics generated below your signal, subharmonics. That's one important thing. The other thing is that if you create harmonic content going above Nyquist, you get aliasing. What is aliasing? It's actually the folding back of frequency that are above your Nyquist frequency that, can, that come back in the audio range. As soon as you have more than one sign playing, which is actually the case of like 99.99999% of the music, you create harmonics, but you also create inharmonics. Imagine if you have 100 and 101 hertz, you create a sub at 1 hertz, 2 hertz, 3 hertz, and you create noise. Same goes for the higher part with the folding back, those, those, those harmonics folding back in the audio spectrum. They are not entire uh, numbers from a fundamental frequency. They are not... Uh, even or odd harmonics, they are just partials, it's noise. So by adding distortion, you are also creating noise and you are also blurring the low end. So even if you used at the beginning of your chain an EQ to cut out the lows on some sound because you wanted to clean that take, for example, and it's a good practice to start by cleaning that, after you added distortion, you will find back this. So this is why my first recommendation would be that actually, even if you EQ'd before saturation, you might want to tame out the lows after saturation in order to keep a clean low end. Because if you do this on several tracks, you have a lot of piling up of actually noisy, dirty, low end information. And this is blurring your mix. If you use distortion and create harmonics that go above Nyquist frequency, of course, there are distortions that have oversampling, so they don't um, they don't have this cramping, this aliasing happening inside the plugin, but the harmonics are there. And if after this distortion, you are putting another non-linear processing, by non-linear processes, I'm thinking about compressors, limiters, whatever transfer curve that is actually not linear, that is also inducing total harmonic distortion. Any process that is adding THD that's adding distortion, if it's fed by a signal with harmonics up to Nyquist, 
will create other harmonics that fold back. This is why a tool, for example, like TDR from Tokyodan is a tool that I use in every mastering session before non-linear processors. I'm going to let you hear the difference between this, for example, and this. And this is just that because before any non-linear process, I removed the excessive highs. I'm not filtering anything in the audible range. It's everything that's happening above the audio range. This aliasing is actually making a mess of your high end, removing the crispiness, removing the clarity, making it more harsh. This is what a lot of people refer to as digital sound. The digital harshness is actually high end aliasing. And at the same time, if you use this in a mix with several distortions, you add a lot of low end. So now that I know that, I know that I should also put a low cut filter or a low shell filter after my distortion to remove low end. That's one thing, but there's more because distortion is a process that is related to the spectral content and to the loudness. You may want also sometimes in order to really craft and to fine tune the sound of your distortion, to boost some frequencies before the saturation, to enhance the harmonic content on that range and then to scoop them afterwards so that actually you can create more warmth, more harmonics on a certain spectrum without actually boosting that spectrum, boosting pre-distortion and cutting after. That's another take on EQs and saturation. Also for mastering, this is why actually you should always start your mastering session by removing resonant frequencies. And this is why, for example, in every session that I use in a mastering, but also in a mix, if I want to put saturation on a channel, I'll put a little suit to from Urksound before just to tame a bit of those resonances. Why? Because all those peaking resonances will create more harmonics. And also that will create intermodulation distortion. create more, not more, but a stronger, there will be there, the frequency will be there, what, whatever happens, but the stronger those resonances are, the stronger, the higher, the intermodulation distortion coming from those frequencies will be. So long story short, if you want some very good sounding and clean, but yet warm and, and rich sounds, remove any unwanted low end before, because it's adding to the intermodulation distortion, remove any unwanted resonances before, and if you cut a lot of the low end before distortion, cut them back after. And also if your sound has been processed before, it's just recorded or just coming out of a synth, you don't care, but if your sound has been processed before by some non-linear processings, creating harmonics up to Nyquist, filter the top end out before your distortion to avoid excessive aliasing, and whenever you can, use over-sampled saturation plugins. This is making a huge difference in the sonic result. And here it is. May this elevate your music to new heights. Cheers.